Maverick Fisher's garden has its roots in San Antonio, where he grew up around native plants beloved by his grandmother, Jane Maverick McMillan, and mother, Mary Maverick Fisher. In 2005, when he bought a 1940s cottage on a sloping lot in East Travis Heights, he went intentionally informal with natives from Texas and northern Mexico. It's not a mansion, and so I did not feel that a formal garden made much sense. I decided to go with informality, and I guess, you know, there also, if you're going with native plants, you know, this is, you know, we're, this is Texas, we're a down-to-earth place. I mean, does it really make sense to try and make Texas plants look like Versailles? So I think it's also, South Austin would just be not in, in keeping with the zeitgeist to go for, for uh, something so, so formal. While devoting energy to fixing up the house, he dabbled in the garden. All along, though, Maverick considered his outdoor walls as important as those indoors. The turning point came when he hooked up with plant-driven designers Lauren Springer Ogden and Scott Ogden, in tandem with Patrick Kerwin. His goal? A wildlife habitat that was sustainable now and in 30 years. The Ogdens went for layers of succulents, grasses, and perennials favored by pollinators and hummingbirds. The Ogdens managed front curb crepe myrtles. Instead, they chose Cenizo and generous pink flamingo muley grasses for privacy against a dramatically inclined bisecting street that aligns with Maverick's front door. To prevent vehicles from careening through his property, they installed hefty boulder stop gaps. To enclose the garden on a sunny side, they chose Cenizo, rusty black hoy viburnum, and fiddlewood. On the other side, this one in shade, they layered an airy swath of understory trees and perennials. One thing that hasn't changed, aside from selective pruning, is the treasured historic live oak hugging the house. And I think that was uh, probably a volunteer because it's in a weird spot, but I, of course, kept it. To navigate from front to back, Maverick went artistically sustainable. There was a, a stone patio that was failing, according to an engineer. So when I ripped it up, I just saved all the limestone uh, flagstones and then uh, created a, a sinuous garden path there. There were uh, chunks of sidewalk that were, had formed part of the path, and it was just, you know, it looked like a sidewalk. Scott actually had an ingenious idea, and he said, oh, all you gotta do is just flip it over, and then you get all this texture. In back, Maverick's view matches his philosophy, now that crowds of invasive plants and a Chinese pistache no longer claim the space. I thought it was very important for the wildlife to get rid of the invasives. That was my main goal there. Even though it's just blocks from hectic Riverside Drive, the shielded patio seems miles away. For shade and a break from the back alley view, the Ogden selected a grove of silver-toned Mexican sycamores. I wanted privacy sooner rather than later, so I decided to go with trees that would grow quickly. Initially, I'd planted one, and Scott and Lauren came back that this was an opportunity to create what they called an informal grove. Now, it does mean that I sacrifice privacy in the winter because, of course, the, the sycamore drops its leaves and then I have my unattractive view of the driveways and, and chain link. But I am okay with that because I also wanted to honor the, the fact that there had been an arroyo behind the house, which has now been paved over for an alley. But when I arrived, there were a number of riparian trees, a bunch of cottonwoods, old, old, beautiful old trees, and sadly, not one of them is still standing. The, the last three or four died during the drought of 2011. So these sycamores are an, uh, an homage to uh, the arroyo behind my place. His cattle panel and red cedar post fence is less obtrusive than solid wood and invites lots of vining opportunities. That is a vine that Scott and Lauren came up with and it is a close relation of Virginia creeper. This one is called Hacienda creeper. It is from the Hacienda Santa Engracia in Tamaulipas in uh, northeastern Mexico, where a bunch of the plants here are from that zone. It is more domesticated in the sense that it's smaller. Virginia creeper can just kind of get out of control, like Amazonian almost in its, uh, in its growth, and this is uh, much smaller, more delicate, not as aggressive. Well, you have the same issue with the deck. It needs to be softened with something organic so it isn't just too, uh, too man-made. The way he dealt with that is putting pots in the driveway and then a chain for the, the creeper to go up. It's not total privacy, but just really the psychologically, I think you really only need a, a sense of a screen. It doesn't have to be a, a wall to make you feel a little more like you're in an intimate space. He did create a wall of Alphonse Car Bamboo on one side of the driveway. We're in a zone called the Sprinkled Clay, and it's 
uh, a nightmare in the sense that you're always going to have cracks in your you know your plaster and your sheetrock and the fence on my northern border is actually sliding off the hill and I had spent so much money on the fence for uh, the the back garden space that I, I didn't really want to get into paying for red cedar and hog wire again. Of course, the key is not to get the horrible spreading kind that was here uh, when I arrived, the golden bamboo. This is a very anciently domesticated Taiwanese type of bamboo called Alphonse Carr. So I'm just leaving the collapsing chain link fence in place and, and covering it with bamboo. On the other side, the Ogden selected a mature maverick mesquite for instant privacy, a thornless cultivar of honey mesquite, its springtime yellow flowers attract bees, while its whispery leaves opt for contrast against the sycamore's broad lobes. This is uh, you know, an area where I might grill or hang around the fire pit. Instead of a firm hedge along this border, evergreen and deciduous textures companion through foliar and seasonally floral depth. Strappy succulents promenade with fluffy flowers. In this certified backyard habitat, Maverick provides options to increase his wildlife participation. It didn't take long for the word to get out about this little haven of food and water. Hummingbirds tend to go for the red flowers. The insects are going to be going for the, the ones more on the blue end of things. He offsets all the excitement with an easy care buffalo grass break. It's also a playground for Echo and King John. Underneath, earthworms and beneficial insects welcome its cool housing. Maverick's garden represents a journal of his never-ending exploration. For a time, he even kept free-range chickens, eager insect monitors that scratched the dog's turf to dust. I've come to learn that a garden is never completed. There is never an end point. It is an ongoing process. It's an evolution. We'll see what makes it. And if, if I find something's very happy and, and likes it here, then I'll plant more of it. And if other things don't work, well, it was, it was a fun experiment. But this is another thing to gardeners, take hope. If you stay on top of weeding and you get rid of things before they go to seed, you'll find that year after year, you're dealing with fewer weeds and fewer invasives. Planting has been a real experience of, of getting to know this space. Where we are sitting is an ancient terrace of the Colorado River. But if you start digging about a foot down, you find tons of cobblestones from that deposited by the river. And so I've incorporated those also into uh, you know, various borders to demarcate beds. I plan on never selling this house if I, if I can help it, and I believe that creates a sense of space that is lost in an era when people think in terms of starter homes. You know, we always want to build up that that big mansion down the road. And that kind of denies the opportunity. I mean, why would you plant a tree if you're not going to be around to enjoy its shade, unless you're a true idealist like Martin Luther? I hope to be here in 20 more years and see, see how I did with my plants, if uh, the things that I planted did in fact survive a world of climate change. <laughs>